thank you all for coming to um, today's congressional briefing um, to focus on the SASTA for PMS um, building an innovative, innovative national response network in underserved communities. Uh, my name is Luis Spillane. I am the CEO of the National Health IT Collaborative for the NSERF. Let me start off, uh, let me just, uh, we start off by just thanking uh, our congressional co-chairs, uh, Congresswoman Plasky, uh, Congresswoman gonzalez Ball, and Congresswoman Masui. You should just read the slides. This is the next slide. Uh, we have uh, our sponsors today is uh, an organization that's been working with us closely, Tech Club, uh, the Hims Foundation, uh, who's been gracious to us since our founding of this organization, as well as uh, our co-hosts, uh, Healthcare Ready, uh, HCU, and the Hims Institute. Let me start by giving a quick overview of the NHIT organization. Uh, the National Health IT Collaborative for the Underserved was launched back in 2008 uh, with the focus of addressing health disparities by leveraging health information technology. Uh, we, we have five pillars in the organization. Uh, workforce, innovation, policy, and research. But at the very core of the organization is community. Part of what we're doing here today is engaging and educating our community about the work that we do and ensuring that we're from benefit from the benefit from, from health information technology. Uh, over the last couple of years, we've led efforts on precision medicine, uh, our Wall Street Summit, uh, the Lifeline Roundtable. We've done uh, hepatitis outreach efforts, uh, social determinants of health. Those are some of the efforts that we have done. Uh, but on September 20th, uh, business as usual changed um, for our organization. Uh, I was born in Puerto Rico, and as a result, I always stay in touch with my family. And I knew, uh, we missed Irma, but I knew Maria was something different. And every day, I would stay in touch with my family to get ready and prepare. Uh, and what we realized after the storm is that we lost all communications with our family. Uh, so we launched working with uh, the Puerto Rico Primary Care Association, uh, this effort, the NHIT Care Campaign, uh, in an effort to help uh, the Puerto Rico federally qualified health centers the USVI federally qualified health centers. Uh, uh, so this is the focus of the, of the initiative, is the National Health IT Collaborative with guidance from our partners, and some of them are here, Sprint, AWS, uh, Healthcare Ready, uh, launched this campaign with the mission to restoring um, the health safety net for the people of Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands in the wake of hurricanes in Irma and Maria. Since we launched the initiative, we've put over $2 million of work, of pro bono work and resources into Puerto Rico. We teamed up with AWS uh, to put uh, on their cloud the Open EMR Plus. We uh, teamed up with Sprint to send two-way radios into uh, the federally qualified health centers and also help re-establish the mental health facilities under Inspira uh, by getting their call centers and their sites back up and running. Those were 13 different sites. We also put these toolkits that uh, were used in Harvey uh, in Houston and we replicated that uh, for Puerto Rico. We made sure that this whole initiative was focused on how by leveraging our community stakeholders, our community partners, these are some of them. And also, most importantly, or as importantly, uh, next slide, we will see our private sector um, partners, um, campaign partners. 
Uh, and the reason why I highlight this is because this was truly that community that we talked about. This was truly a private sector effort, uh, private, public, private sector effort to make sure that we got all um, those resources into the ground. Uh, we worked closely for the last eight, nine months with our federal partners on not just putting the strategy together, but also participating on the ASPRO working groups in the Virgin Islands, visiting uh, the sites in Puerto Rico, uh, and also strategizing with our federal partners to, in terms of what, what would health IT and innovation look like in the long term for Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. Uh, part of what we want to talk about today is this whole concept of building a national response network in underserved communities. When you look at um, federal investments, such as the Lifeline Program, uh, falls out of ONC, or uh, Empower, um, HSS Empower out of ASPR, what you realize is that there are federal investments already in place where you could communicate with these underserved communities well in advance. You could send them text messages, you could do geo mapping uh, and geo health. So there are a lot of activities and, and, and tools already in place that we could be leveraging. And, and our panelists today will be talking about that. So with that said, uh, thank you all for being here. I'm gonna turn it over to Congresswoman Donna Christian. Thank you, Willis. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank morning. you for being here. It's great to see you such a full room. As yeah, as we're all anxiously praying and holding our breath, hoping that the hurricane season that we are now in uh, will not be as bad as it's projected to be. Port Arthur and Beaumont are already underwater, and we've had two main storms in the Pacific. So no matter what, we have to plan and be prepared for whatever might come. In, in the last eight months, since, the, since Irma and Maria, I've often wondered what happened to what we learned after Hugo and Maryland in the Virgin Islands, and Georgia's in Puerto Rico, and of course Katrina, which taught us all great lessons. Today's briefing is about taking the lessons we learned from Harvey, Irma, Maria, and the California fires to ensure that we're better prepared today than we were in September 2017. And key among the disruptions that we must mitigate are those with elect electricity connection, electrical service, and communications. They affected everything from the supply chain and ultimately health. I don't have to tell anyone here today that we're still trying to find, figure out how many people died directly and indirectly from Maria and Puerto Rico. And we have, we have the same issues in the Virgin Islands as well. Our panelists are here to talk about their experiences in the aftermath of those storms what those experiences taught them about mitigating those disruptions, and how do we move forward to avoid the tragic losses that ours and other jurisdictions face then and may face again. Technology is key. It's key to improving healthcare delivery systems in good times, and it is most certainly critical when responding effectively to disasters. And so is having data about the healthcare landscape, the people, and mapping the socioeconomic determinants in jurisdictions, as well as, of course, having a plan that's updated and tested. So let's begin with opening remarks from our esteemed congressional sponsors. And we are going to begin with our prime sponsor, Congresswoman Stacey Paskett. Of course, Congresswoman Paskett is my congresswoman. And she's done a yeoman's job in bringing not only attention, but also funding to the territory for response and recovery. She's led several CODELs and media trips to the Virgin Islands and has spoken often from the floor to make sure that we are not forgotten. I could not ask for a better person to take over the helm of the Virgin Islands Congressional Office, and she has expanded it and taken it to a new level. The Congresswoman serves on the House Transportation and Infrastructure and agriculture committees, two key committees to the recovery of all of the hard hit areas. In her two terms, she's been a leader and strong advocate for the Virgin Islands, especially regarding state-like treatment and voting rights, as well as for economic development for all underserved communities here in the United States and in the Caribbean. So help me welcome our my Congresswoman, Stacey Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
you so much for that warm welcome, um, and good morning, everyone. I'd first like to thank each and every one of you who are here taking time out of your day to discuss an issue that's particularly important to myself and to the members of this panel, and hopefully important to you by your attendance here as well. Um, this congressional briefing on disaster preparedness is really important, as was said, as we're now in hurricane season once again. I'd like to thank, take time to thank co-hosts, Healthcare Ready, the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved, and the HIMSS Foundation's Institute for eHealth Policy. Of course, our sponsors for this briefing, which are also HIMSS Foundation's Institute for eHealth Policy, TechFlow, the National Health IT Collaborative for the Underserved. Of course, I'm grateful for the panelists who are going to share their expertise and their knowledge with us. And lastly, I'd like to thank my congressional co-chairs, Congresswoman Jennifer gonzalez Colon and Congresswoman Doris Matsui. And of course, the esteemed Congresswoman Don Christensen, who is the first female physician to serve in Congress, who's been a healthcare advocate even before coming to Congress, and of course, when she says that she wants to put on a panel in Congress, I have to do what I'm told. <laughs> so we're really grateful for her continued leadership. She has not stopped working on behalf of people in the Virgin Islands, as well as for healthcare issues that are important to so many of us. Um, most underserved communities throughout the U.S., including the U.S. territories, that were impacted by the natural disasters of 2017 are still in recovery mode rather than rebuilding mode while preparing themselves for the natural disasters to come this year. Um, in the Virgin Islands Daily News newspaper today, there was discussion of the Virgin Islands government's um, assessment of its preparedness for the 2018 hurricane season, which is really at this point discussing evacuation. Many people in the Virgin Islands still have, particularly for those individuals who still have tarps on their roofs today, um, almost 10,000 people, 10,000 homes still, out of a population of 105,000. In the U.S. Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, communities are scrambling to fix the damage to their homes while also securing it for the hurricane season. In this briefing, you will have a conversation that we should have had before the de devastation occurred last year. The reality is that while all communities in California, Texas, Florida, Puerto Rico, and the US Virgin Islands were impacted by natural disasters, underserved and rural communities suffer even more in these instances. We saw that in Katrina, we saw that last year in Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. The lack of appropriate healthcare and healthcare infrastructure in these communities created more challenges in the recovery and rebuilding processes. Public health and healthcare infrastructure provides both the federal and local governments the capacity to respond to emergency disasters in a more effective manner. Disaster preparedness can only be effective, however, with adequate funding put in place, not just for the aftermath of these disasters, but beforehand. Uh, just to take you back into the disaster funding that we've received, the White House requested $44 billion with offsets for all areas affected by the hurricane. When that request was brought to Congress, the House approved $81 billion, and the Senate bumped that number back up, increasing what eventually became an $86 billion disaster funding which still was not all of the funding requested or needed by these areas. There were also significant support provisions in other areas of the bill. The bill also contained changes in the law to allow rebuilding of critical infrastructure in a more resilient manner. Previously under the Stafford Act, the law had said that you could give money to rebuild as it was before the disaster. Now language was specifically put in for the Virgin Isles of Puerto Rico, which said to rebuild as it should be. Um, in addition, the Virgin Islands received additional funding of 142 million through September 2019 for Medicaid. 
with 100% federal match of these funds for two years. During her time here in Congress, Congresswoman Christensen fought an enormous fight for the parity of the territories in Medicaid and other funding. Um, which ha the Virgin Islands of Puerto Rico have a demography, a demographics similar to Mississippi, which receives over 80% federal cost share for Medicaid without a cap on that amount. The Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico receive significantly less percentage while having demographics similar to Mississippi and also are capped after a certain amount, which was arbitrarily put there by Congress and has no correlation to the actual need of the area. The US Virgin Islands received the type of funding we needed months after our discussions with House and Senate appropriators, testimony given in front of relevant committees, Republican and Democratic colleagues offering amendments and bills that cause discussion on principal issues of importance to us, and working with the House leadership, Senators Chuck Schumer and Senator Mitch McConnell, and I believe especially impactful was having almost 100 members of Congress, both the House and the Senate, coming to the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico to see firsthand the effects of the destruction. That cannot be mitigated. Um, a week, less than a week after uh, Majority Leader Kevin McCarthy and Minority Whip Steny Hoyer led a codel together, days after coming back from Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands, they issued a joint op-ed together that talked about changing Stafford Act to building as it should be because they saw the fiscal inequity and the fiscal irresponsibility of not doing it that way. Um, this was the fifth time that Congress had given the Virgin Islands funding to rebuild its grid as it was rather than as it should be. Uh, the funding received will help with recovery and rebuilding efforts, but the funding does not include anywhere near the full amount or all of the requests of the Virgin Islands. I think especially instrumental in us crafting what our request should be was not just the needs, but really being in touch with those legislatures who were here during the time of Hurricane Katrina and who were advocating on behalf of the people of that area of Louisiana, working with Mary Landro, working with Cedric Richmond, Congressman Cedric Richmond, to really understand what the healthcare needs and what worked and what didn't work in that area. Um, Congresswoman Gonzalez Colon will also share my sentiments, I'm sure, to many of the federal funding hurdles we have both had to endure in obtaining disaster funding, and more importantly, parity in funding for the territories, which I cannot stress to you is the most important part. Much of the destruction of our infrastructure in the Virgin Islands, whether that be hospitals or our schools, were um, drastically exacerbated by the fact that we had not been spending money on deferred maintenance of those facilities because most of our money was going to pay for nurses and doctors, teachers, or school supplies. Um, there had not been a new school built in the Virgin Islands in over 20 years. I hope that this briefing today will start a much needed discussion on disaster preparedness and how we can provide better awareness on these topics, which will push us in the direction to make necessary changes and efforts before the disasters take any more homes, jobs, and lives. So I want to thank you all for your attention. Uh, I'm looking forward to the outtakes from this session and how myself and the other co-hosts of this event can really utilize those in legislative agendas moving forward to support the people of these areas. Thank you all so much. sponsors will join us throughout the event, but we're going to move on to, to our um,
panel, um, and let me introduce them. We're going to now explore how the combination of federal investments, such as FCC's Lifeline program, and other technology will allow officials to notify and communicate with millions in the Lifeline program, including sending alerts, tracking patients and hotspots, and providing communication to be able to team up with federal partners during disasters. Our panelists are, I'll start with uh, Sarah Baker, who is sitting in for Nicolette Toussaint from Healthcare Ready, who was called away um, for a meeting that she could not refuse at the last moment. And just to say a word about Healthcare Ready, um, Healthcare Ready's um, website says, from our position at the nexus of the public and private sectors, Healthcare Ready works year-round on efforts dedicated to creating strong, resilient healthcare system that is empowered to act as efficiently and proactively as possible. And that's only half of the story because they have come to the ready in so many disasters. And let me just read what one supporters said from the Louisiana Department of, of Health back a few years ago. Like so many here in Louisiana, our health centers were flooded, which put large rural communities at risk, having no access to health care at a time when they needed it the most. Healthcare Ready immediately got to work, helping us with the resources necessary to get up and running, care for our patients, and ensure our community could rebound from the disaster. And they've done that in many other places, including Puerto Rico and are prepared to help us in the Virgin Islands as well. So representing Healthcare Ready will be Sarah Baker, the, the program manager. I'm going to do all of the introductions, um, and then we'll uh, get started. Um, our next panelist is Dr. Linda Chin, an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, the Association of American Physicians, and the American Society for Clinical Investigation. Dr. Chin is a renowned cancer genomic scientist at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, where she was professor at Harvard Medical School and a senior associate member at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. In 2015, foreseeing the need for a new model to harness the potential of real-world health and health-related data, Dr. Chin launched the Institute for Health Transformation as a chief innovation officer for the University of Texas system to develop READY real-world education, early detection and intervention, an infrastructure platform for connected health data and care delivery ecosystem. Our third panelist is uh, with us at NHIT, Greg Gladbutt. He's currently the Chief Digital Officer at TechFlow, also a sponsor, and the HIT PMO Director for the NHIT Healthcare Campaign. Greg Garber, Godbout is a former Environmental Protection Agency Chief Technology Officer and Presidential Innovation Fellow. He co-founded and served as the first Executive Director of the General Services Administration, ATNF Digital Services Organization. Those are our panelists, and we'll begin with you today. Thank you, Dr. Christensen, for that, um, for that introduction to the release in the NHIT um, club campaign for inviting us. We're very happy to be here. Um, so first, I just want to spend a few minutes kind of giving an introduction of, of who Healthcare Ready is, um, kind of beyond um, that wonderful introduction that we had a few minutes ago. We play a little bit of a unique role um, in the disaster response space. So we are a nonprofit that was formed actually um, kind of as a result of following Hurricane Katrina to help kind of foster that public public sector and private sector information sharing collaboration. Um, one of the many kind of challenges and lessons learned from Hurricane Katrina was that those contexts just weren't there. That coordination between the public and private sector, especially in regards to medicine, um, just wasn't there. And so there was an informal coalition um, started kind of from healthcare supply chain components and non and nonprofits, including the American Red Cross, um, to form kind of a working group to to work through some of these issues. And um, we saw that there was such a demand for this kind of coordination role and this um, information sharing capacity that we became an official um, nonprofit as a result of that. So we are kind of a part disaster response organization, part preparedness organization. So we are national in scope and that we will activate for any disaster um, impacting healthcare, public health across 
the country. So even though we're based here in Washington, D.C., we have a virtual emergency operations center that can support um, any, any event across the country. And so when we're not activated for a disaster, kind of serving in that coordination role, we're doing a lot of um, kind of preparedness and resilience programming informed by the lessons learned that we've seen in disasters. Um, and so understandably, we have a kind of a lot that's been going on since last year, including these new partnerships that we've formed um, with everyone here at the table. And just to kind of give, we find it's, it's helpful to kind of point out where we work. Um, so we're a nonprofit that we work very closely with the private sector, but we work very closely with the public sector also. So we're kind of between the public and private sectors, but also between healthcare and emergency management also. So we do kind of information sharing, explaining you know how the private sector healthcare supply chain works to public sector responders, because we've seen that um, you know it's something I mean 92 or 93 percent of healthcare critical infrastructure is owned or operated by the private sector. But then we see during a disaster, it's the public sector that's responding to this. And so we need to have strong coordination um, and kind of establish communication between these two parties. Um, and that's a role that we, that we help play um, as, as much as we can. And so kind of before I get into this slide, um, kind of a little bit more about what we do when we're activated for a disaster, we kind of, we see it um, kind of in three phases. The first phase, of our um, disaster activations is helping to make sure healthcare supply chains are up and running. We know that healthcare um, for all, for rural areas, urban, underserved, um, everyone is dependent on an operational supply chain. So we work to make sure that healthcare supply chains are up and running. We then kind of work with healthcare facilities, making sure they have the medicines, the supplies, the resources that they need, um, and also the services that water is being restored to them, the telecommunications access is kind of being restored to them. They're prioritized in those in those processes, and then kind of finally, um, we work with, with people, with patients, um, making sure that patients are connected back to care, that they have um, ideally uninterrupted access to care, or when that is interrupted, that they're connected as quickly as possible. And so that brings us to kind of one of the signature kind of things that we offer or that we have during disasters. Our map known as RX Open, um, and so RX Open is another kind of good example of a public-private partnership in action. Um, Rx Open is a map that displays the operating status of pharmacies across the country. Um, and so it's the map is unique in that it shows all pharmacies, so not just chain pharmacies or CVS, Walgreens, et cetera, but also community and independently owned pharmacies. And so um, we've seen that Rx Open, this map has been, um, it's useful for all, for all users, for patients, for emergency managers, for everyone um, to really find, to be connected back to care, to be able to refill their medicines, to um, you know, get, get the medical supplies they need. But we've also seen in catastrophic events um, that pharmacies kind of become anchor institutions for communities. They'll go there to charge their cell phones, um, to, to seek shelter. So kind of knowing which pharmacies are open or, um, and these ancillary care facilities is really important. Um, and we've seen that and kind of this map has been so dependent or so relied upon by a lot of our partners, um, we've received a grant to see um, if it's possible to create something like RX Open, but for another type of healthcare facility. So kind of one of the lessons learned that we've, that we've had, not just from last hurricane season, but even kind of events before that was knowing the operational status of not just hospitals, but all other healthcare facilities. Hospitals are important, but there's, Kind of a lot of attention given to hospitals already. So, what about those ancillary care facilities, community health clinics, federally qualified health centers, centers those safety net clinics? And so, we have a, a project right now seeing if we can create something like RX Open, but for community health clinics. And so, um, we're excited to kind of see where that goes and hopefully create another tool um, for the community to have. And then I'll kind of spend a, a little bit of time kind of. The, some of the lessons learned that we saw from um, Hurricane Maria, but also kind of the broader 2017 hurricane season. Um, and so kind of from our position as a nonprofit and a kind of coordination capacity, um, we have a pretty good holistic view of healthcare operations. We see kind of what the supply chain challenges are, but then we also get kind of individual patient calls to our to our hotline and to our um, alerts email account. So we, we have a, a good view of healthcare. Um, and we kind of, a 
another phrase we use to kind of describe what we do is we help the helpers. Um, so we make sure that a lot of our nonprofit partners who are on the ground have what they need, or we are able to kind of relay information that we're hearing from the public sector down to them very quickly. And so kind of some of the, some of the challenges or lessons learned that we've seen uh, from Maria, of course, um, the first is supply chain operations. We saw that you know making sure that manufacturers and distributors and others on the island are able to continue operations was key. Um, not just that the product was being made, but also so that um, you know residents had somewhere to take shelter and that they had somewhere to go as well. And so making sure that that kind of coordination between private sector supply chain operators on the island was that coordination with the public sector was there was very important. Um, another kind of lesson learned that we've seen is kind of donation, um, donation coordination. There was a tremendous amount of goodwill um, following Hurricane Maria. People wanted to donate supplies and, and get them down there, but you know, I think everyone's kind of seen this, the unique challenges that an island presented for getting materials, getting supplies onto both Puerto Rico and USVI was very challenging. We saw, um, and also Puerto Rico functions as you know, kind of the main supply to the USVI also, so there were kind of cascading effects that things couldn't get to Puerto Rico, they couldn't get to the USVI. Um, and so kind of managing some of those cascading effects or anticipating what some of those were was very important. Um, and that kind of brings us to our third slide, kind of working with USVI, we, we saw that, um, you know, kind of learning their needs was very important um, because, because of that cascading effect, right? If, if Puerto Rico wasn't able to get the supplies, the healthcare supplies that their patients needed, it was even harder to make sure that, that patients on the USVI had them. So kind of working to make sure that all of those equities were at the table during response plans was very important. Um, we saw many public health concerns come out also, making sure that you know we were able to address kind of water challenges. There were a lot of, there was a lot of um, kind of activity in shipping water down to, U to USBI, to Puerto Rico, and that was very, very time consuming and very heavy to do also. So making sure that water purifying tablets could get down there, because it was hard to truck water into some of these remote areas. So kind of anticipating some of those public health impacts and seeing how we can work to resolve those was also important. And then finally, um, kind of communications, making sure that telecommunications is being restored. And you know, we're seeing that, you know, of course hospitals are being prioritized, of course in dialysis centers, but making sure that explaining why some of these rural clinics needed telephones restoration or needed radios was just as important as you know making sure hospitals had access and kind of communicating the dependencies on the island. Um, community health cl clinics play such an incredible role on the island. Um, I think a lot of kind of federal responders going down weren't used to that dynamic or weren't familiar with it. So kind of communicating that um, became very important also. And so kind of some of the just key takeaways that we, we saw from last year and that we're continuing to work on this year um, is, of course, working with vulnerable populations. We've seen vulnerable populations can mean different things to different people and in different areas. Um, and so kind of making sure that these populations are accounted for in response plans and resilience plans and recovery plans. Um, and looking at medically fragile populations, two groups that we saw that we worked a lot with during this hurricane, during this, um, during this activation were kind of uninsured patients, um, make, making sure that they still had access to medications to prevent them from going need to go to the hospitals, but also controlled substances, um, not just in Puerto Rico and USVI, but Florida and Texas as well. There's kind of, there, there, there was a dearth of guidance on controlled substances and how patients could refill them or what the process was for that. Um, and so making sure that we have those in plans going forward, forward would be very important. Um, working with the supply chain, making sure that these are always prioritized and planned so that patients have uninterrupted access to care. Um, donations and supplies, like I was saying, making sure that there's central coordinators for those donations, and making sure that we're able to route those efficiently, knowing, kind of anticipating both short-term needs, also longer-term needs for clinics, and trying to get, you know, not just putting Band-Aids on solutions all the time, but having, having more supplies delivered when they're needed. Um, and kind of, and finally, you know, data, making sure that we're using data in a smart way, especially, um, you know, if we're focused on IT here, it's, it's very important that we're using data creatively, 
um, leveraging what we can, um, what we're already collecting in response plans, but also thinking smartly about how we're going to have redundant systems so that um, you know we always have the information that we need. And so as we're we've kind of moved into this 2018 hurricane season already, some of the kind of key things that we've been working on partners and um, you know making sure that they have at the top of their mind is you know being clear on who you're dependent on um, and who you can work with. Um, you know, if one sector goes down or if one plant goes down, what the, the kind of backup plan is. And, um, you know, kind of a, a unique part of Maria that we saw was just the sustained, how long the response was. I think a lot of people weren't prepared for just how long that response was. And so making sure that, you know, to the extent <coughs> possible, you have um, supplies needed for more than just a couple of days. And finally, um, kind of making sure that, that staff are taken care of and that patients have what they need. No. Thank, you. Thank you, Sarah. Healthcare Ready is the Virgin Islands' new best friend. We're so glad to have you on board. Dr. Chip? Thank you. Thank you, uh, Louise, for inviting me and Dr. Chip for introducing uh, and certainly to the uh, congressional. Um, members from sponsoring this meeting. I'm going to follow on the, what Sarah has been talking about, what Healthcare Ready has been doing, facilitating that cross-sector collaboration that clearly is very important, and, and you have heard about how that's critical to the response uh, that's on the ground. But I'm going to maybe take us a little uh, a step further and share with you the lessons we have learned um, in, in a um, community down along the border in South Texas and how we can think a little bit further ahead. I know we have to deal with the upcoming hurricane season. Sorry. No, no, no. Okay. I would say I'm just reminded that you know South border Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the you know not just reacting and, and preparing for this year's disaster that I'm sure will come unfortunately, but thinking ahead and how do we Think about building an infrastructure that can be a little bit more um, ready and reactive um, and so that leveraging the technology and I think some of the lessons we've learned down in South Texas can be shared. So a, a few things that I wanted to start out that I hope that you take away from um, what I hope to touch on is the fact that we absolutely need to leverage the investment the federal government's already put in. But let's not forget, as we have heard from Healthcare Ready, and there's a lot more, we have to learn how to tap into the private sector. They are investing an enormous amount in technology, in care delivery, supply chain for sure, that's their business. But the question is how do we tap into their, not just assets and capability, but ultimately their balance sheets? Because they invest, they do uh, research, and how do we use that to our benefit, or the public health benefit? So we heard about the Lifeline and Power Hose. We have heard and seen a lot um, in the press about how the retail industry is you know, gearing up and really, and the technology industry is so interested in um, healthcare. And certainly, the, we heard about the importance of telecommunication, which is on top of that, the mobile devices and the cloud. Uh, uh, in terms of facilitating that communication. And at the end of it, all of that translates into having the data and knowing what to do with the data. Uh, without that, we can't be smart. I and mean, that's really the goal. So one of the things, so aside from that, I want to share with you one of the um, concepts that I've been really strongly advocating is the ability to the need for a common infrastructure. Think of it as a 21st century public utility. We think about highway and bridges and we all understand their importance, but in 21st century, there's a digital highway and bridges. And let's not forget, that should not be, you know, in the hand of, you know, think about digital highway, you don't want your car manufacturer to build them. You don't want a GM highway, you don't want a Toyota highway, you want a public highway that everybody can use. So how do we think about that when it comes to our digital and health IT infrastructure? Um, and, and more importantly, we hear about reactivating or activating services in response to disaster. How do we think about having a system that can serve 
the population in time of peace, but be ready and can be used for disaster response in emergency. How do we bridge those two important areas so that it's seamless? Because that's where the technology comes in. Um, and, and at the end of the day, we need to have a way of managing those relationships, and I, I think we already heard a lot about that. So with that, I will share with you, and in fact, this conversation began when I was on the panel for the global health, and the same conversation is happening in our, our global health arena in the underserved countries, even though we have many underserved communities in the US. And it's really the same idea that we need to address this, and then particularly, we need, sorry, we need to really think about the infrastructure. That's what I'm gonna talk about today. And there are many other lessons to be learned from here, from um, the international community. But today, I wanna to talk about some of the recommendations that came out from our um, uh, 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 committee report to the administration. One more hit. So we needed a infrastructure, a strategy that addressed security, which we know um, that allow us to have both surveillance and response. But that's really an emergency disaster thing. But that, and we have seen globally how that we react to it, you know, when the bullet hit and when it saw it, and domestically through natural uh, disaster, we are not prepared, we react when things hit. How do we think about a structure that actually is ready? And the way we make it ready is how to deliver services in peacetime that actually has value, so that it's right there and ready and can be used when there's a disaster. So the digital health platform that we imagine now need to be adaptable, you know, certainly to globally and domestically to different community because at the end it's really about the community. And then what we need to is thinking about creating a framework to allow us to um, provide our services in peacetime as well as in emergency. So this is sort of an idea and something that we've been building in South Texas. The idea that we need a agnostic, that public digital highway, um, that allow us to aggregate data. And here we focus on healthcare and research, uh, but certainly you can imagine extending that to social service and to emergency responses, uh, and, and very uh, a sensible way of doing so. But then really, um, I think the FCC really have pushed this, the idea of build once and use many times, and same thing we should think about that with data. How do we aggregate the data and use it many times? Use it for healthcare delivery in peacetime and response, such as patients that are connected digitally because we're monitoring them for their chronic disease management, or they are on dialysis machine because that's part of their care. That connection can now be used as a way of knowing who is really at risk when the electricity grid goes out. And those are the people your emergency service have to go first because you know, their life may be dependent and the battery lasts for six hours. So we gotta get out there. So that's sort of the idea of really using the data more than once, even though you're aggregating data, you know, maybe not necessarily for the same purpose. But very importantly, the blue box on top, which I'll come back to, it is what I think we want to talk about today. So here's the idea from our South Texas project is the idea of changing the way we think about the healthcare system to include the community where the people lived and worked, um, but importantly, create that connectivity so that we have data. And in peace now, we can use this infrastructure to provide care, and I'll show you an example of that. Next slide. So the project we started in South Texas along the border is to, um, sorry, just keep getting um, use that as an opportunity to learn about how to create that kind of connected ecosystem outside of the traditional healthcare environment, engaging the private sector so that we can build a community-based healthcare delivery ecosystem where healthcare data is shared. But how do we do that when we're talking about an underserved population that have very little resource, and we all know that as much as we love to say technology will solve the problem, they are still very expensive, and the, the people that are at the most need for it is the least able to afford it. So we have to think about how to lower that barrier to entry. So this is the infrastructure, the next slide, um, that, that went in and we created. The UT system went in as the convener, and that's an important point I want to end today's talk about. To bring both public and private sector together, in this case, I show you AT&T as our telecommunication partner, Walmart is our retail partner, 
and certainly FQAC as the local community primary care services and some of the cloud service, uh, third party you know, medication fulfillment and certainly patient generated health data that's really popular this day. But the idea is that if you think from the perspective of patient that has the need, it is not really something we want to rely on a health system or a retailer to figure out how to provide the continuity of service. We need to have someone that think about what the patient needs and bring these things together and then make it seamless on behalf of the patients. And that's what we did. And, and importantly, thinking about building an interchange, in this case, using PricewaterhouseCooper as a neutral third party, who is not part of that delivery value chain, which, come back to the highway analogy, uh, is important that it doesn't belong to any car manufacturer to own a segment of the highway. So that we can now have that facilitatory thing. But importantly, figuring out during this process, what are the non-technical things you have to do, which is where the rubber needs to roll. Because at the end of the day, we can bring these people together without the trust, but the trust needs to be verified and constantly reinforced. That's where the operating model comes in, the governance come in, and ultimately all have to translate into contract, particularly when you're thinking about a small FQAC and a Fortune 1 company. Very difficult to put them on the same playing field. Um, and, and that's constantly a challenge. Next slide. And then on top of that, we can start building program. In this case, just to front, we build program to focus on going out to the community, finding people who need a kit. We are starting a retail store, we go to the farmer's market, we go to the colonial, we go to churches, now we're in the city's library. The idea is that we can't wait for them to come to us, because when they do, it's usually in the emergency room, and we don't want to see them that way. We want to find them and provide screening, but importantly, create a connection. So this is where, for example, the lifeline program is so important. We found close to 10,000 people we reach, 50% have no insurance, and 70% of them don't have Wi-Fi access at home. So now, you can talk about how great your mobile techs are. It's not gonna do any good to these people, except for programs like Life that can actually deliver that tool. Otherwise, everything else you talk about wouldn't matter, wouldn't get to these people. Um, and then, the other thing that, that we do is that now, how do we create the ecosystem so that we can have the connection to these people that can share data in real time with other capability, one more, and provide the kind of support they need. Because at the end of the day, whatever you put on the cloud is not gonna work. You need to build a community to support them. And the other example is when patients have complex, have complex disease, multiple comorbidity, how do we manage them in between doctor's visits? An example is the, um, Example would be like the dialysis patient, for example, because that connection allows you to now use it at the time of the emergency. So what we have done, and I'm not going to talk about, we have outcome data showing that we can improve control of um, um, the, the, the chronic condition, for example. But the question now is that imagine that framework where we can now think about extending that across to public services, disaster response, in a way that at the same time providing, using these technology to, to be connected to the population and help manage their health, which clearly will be an important aspect as well. And then, what I want to really add here is the role of the convener. When we show up in, the, in this city, the second poorest county, the number two poorest city along, you know, in the country, um, the private industry showing up with the, the, the um, private big company, Fortune 20 company, there's significant trust, trust issues there. And that's where the role of Kamina comes in. The Kamina needs to come in and help bring these different players together and manage them. Organization, public or private, do not self-organize. I don't care how well-intended you are, they don't organize among themselves. They needed to have the community to help manage them. But that management also needs to be enabled. And that's where the common infrastructure. We have to lower the, the, the work that it takes to share data, the work it takes to collaborate. If it's hard to do, then it's that much easier not to do it. So we have to have the infrastructure to facilitate, and we need the infrastructure to be 
tomorrow's digital utility or the public utility of today or yesterday. Because um, we really need that, and I think there's a role for government to really play a, a facilitatory role there. And then finally, when we are dealing with the Walmart, when we're dealing with AT&T, or even a federally qualified health center, or a community health program that's funded by the faith-based organization, every one of them are well-intended, but they all have an objective. And the question is, who's thinking on the application? Who are ultimately your state? Nobody. That's where the community is. We need a community who's going to be an advocate for the patient to make sure that every component that comes together need to be win-win, but have to be win-win for the patient as well. And I see the role for public entity, nonprofit, like what NHIT have been doing in Puerto Rico to serve the community role to be able to bring all this organization together, and in this case, not just to maximize and amplify the impact of the federal investment, but also to tap into what the private sector can bring. But to do that well, we're gonna need that community to serve, to manage and govern on the application. Thank you, Dr. Chairman. Interesting that you pull the um, global health security agenda into it, because I've done the same thing. It's, it's all one and the same, making sure that communities that are disadvantaged have the tools that they need for their everyday health and to respond to disasters. Thank you. We've been joined, as you can see, by Congresswoman Madeline Bordalio. And um, this, she's a longtime public servant, also my sister and my former partner in crime when I was in Congress. In 2003, Congresswoman Bordalio became the first woman to represent Guam in Congress. She serves on the House Armed Services Committee and Committee on Natural Resources. And Congresswoman Bordalio always finds a way to make Guam a stop for every Codell going to, to Asia. Um, she's the Vice Chair of the Congressional Asian Pacific Island Caucus, and during the creation of the ACA, was a lead health person for that caucus. So she was therefore a part of the Tri-Caucus Group that negotiated with health leadership and the president to get unprecedented um, provisions for the territories and the sort of communities. Um, and of course, when we got all that we got in the house and the Senate wanted to take it away, we spent a number of hours at the White House and the Senate making sure that we got them back. So uh, welcome, Congresswoman Bordalia, to the great greetings. Thank you, thank you very much, Donna. Donna was so uh, one of my closest friends when I came to Washington. I, um, they kind of set you up. They give you a big sister, big brother type of thing, you know. And uh, I looked at over at her and she was reading her Virgin Islands newspaper. And it looked pretty much like the Guam newspaper, you know, full of all kinds of things that other national newspapers really don't cover in depth. So uh, we became sisters in Congress and she's a wonderful lady. I, I miss her. She, she did a lot for health, since she is a, a medical doctor. And, uh, and then uh, we had a big occasion on Guam. Um, it was a big fundraiser type of thing. And I invited Donna, and she was our keynote speaker. So she came all the way over from the Virgin Islands to Guam. Now, out of all the territories, you know, there are five of us, NDC, we don't vote. I don't know if that was mentioned here in this little briefing, but was it? No, we don't vote final passage, and it's very frustrating. Mm -hmm. And uh, so someday I hope that's going to be clarified. I have a bill in now to hopefully, I don't know where it'll go, but uh, we keep trying. But um, I represent the territory that is the farthest from, the, um, from Washington, D.C. Has there anybody in the audience ever been to Guam? Oh my goodness. <laughs> It's a long yeah. trip. Yeah, it's a long trip. <laughs> we have one, we have well, one good, one. 21 hours today, and I go there every month. I have to report to my constituents. But um, because of the length of time, and of course, we, I just want to say this openly. Because of that horrific uh, hurricane in Puerto Rico, I was shocked. It has been a year later, and we're still, people are without electricity, without water, I mean, that's unacceptable, in my opinion. I don't know how the funds are being allocated or how it's being run, but uh, I have told my colleague here 
in Congress how disappointed I am. So these are some of the things, and when it comes to any kind of an issue in the territories, many people just are not that interested. They don't know how far we are away and what it takes to get things here. Uh, you know, every nail that goes into a building of a home in Guam has to come from off island. So it is very, very difficult. And I think what I do here is I just preach Guam, Guam, Guam. Yes, I get teased. Here she comes. Mm -hmm. What does she want? And, uh, but it's okay. I, I don't mind. But I want to touch on health a minute here because we have a group of territories or islands that are near Guam. They were under the trusteeship of the United States for many, many decades. We provided the money for them. They're all low income. It's the Federated States of Micronesia, of Marshalls, Yap, Palau. The gentleman is nodding his head up and down. He's probably been to all of them. But they have many, many issues. And what I'm concerned about is that we in Guam, which I don't think the other, the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico have as much to worry about, but we are sitting ducks. We're a US territory, we have two major bases there, but we're also neighbors to China and North Korea. So thank God for the military security that they provide, because uh, every day we wake up, we don't know, you know, if any of these uh, uh, enemies of ours, the bad guys, are gonna make a statement, they're gonna look to Guam or something that's US. So these islands now are being inundated by China. Uh, they're making big inroads there, and it's a shame, because what they're up doing is they're, they're building hotels, they're building uh, infrastructure, uh, roads, and so forth. These are poor economies. But at the same time, for 30, 40, 50 years, the US has administered them. So I continually warn people, you've got to be very, very careful. The big countries here that are making inroads here, trying to, and you know how it is with the government. When there's money, uh, they seem to succumb. So I want to talk about one thing, just very quickly, Donna, because I really wasn't part of the panel. But, um, we have, um, well, we had a meeting of all the presidents of all these territories that I mentioned. Palau, Yap, uh, Panape, Marshall Islands. And we found out that they have a lot of health problems. So they come to Guam, because Guam has, we have a public hospital, we have the Naval Hospital, and we have a new private hospital. So naturally, they come to these places, but many times they can't pay their bills either. So we have this tremendous deficit in our health programs, and also education. Now we notice that in all of these islands, we talked about uh, a kidney, problems, dialysis. What do they have in the way of dialysis? Well, they all have the machines, but they don't have the technicians. So they have to come. And when they come, they're there for good. I mean, you get a dialysis treatment three, four times a week, uh, forever. So they don't go back home. They stay in Guam, and of course this also is a big thing for our community. But what I hope someday is that we can be able to supply better health programs in these islands. And of course, Guam, I have to say, been generously uh, uh, taken care of by the United States government with grants and all of that. But there's still such a big need uh, for the health situation in our part of the world. And like I say, we're 10,000 miles away. And uh, sometimes I feel that the territories are ignored. And I know Donna will say the same for me. I have people in my office checking every single bill that's introduced into the United States Congress. Territories, is it there or is it just states? And right now, as I'm speaking, I have a person in my office that has found two glaring problems with legislation that has been passed, but there's no word of a territory in there. So here we are, we're all suffering. And I've lived in Guam almost all my life, since I was 13 years old, but don't count the years. <laughs> um, but I, I just want to say, we're important. We're important. Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico, the Atlantic side, the Pacific side, American Samoa, 
um, and Guam and the CNMI. So I, I just want to make people aware that there's more to the United States than just 50 states. Mm -hmm. There's the territories. And we're lacking in many, many things. So I applaud you for coming and I applaud Donna for putting this all together. This is important to me. And I'd like to talk a lot longer, but um, I know there are other speakers. So Donna, many thanks to you. Thank you, so much. Thanks, mm -hmm. Thank you Congresswoman. Thank you for coming and um, for sharing that with us. So we'll move to our third panelist. And um, when you can go ahead. Okay. Hello. Thank you all. Uh, my name is Greg Gaga. I am uh, with NHIT. I'm going to be talking about um, delivery and, and how we, we've been talking a lot about the problems and things like that. And, and the area that I focus on is how do you deliver these public private partnerships. But one of the things I want to point out first, um, as I, I was moved by Congresswoman Stacey uh, Pleskett's uh, talk about build it as it should be. Um, this is, this is sort of core to the heart of NHIT. Our goal in the territories after these storms is not to return to what they were before. Um, what, what was there before from a health infrastructure wasn't enough, it wasn't good enough, it didn't work, right? The goal is to return it to something better, what it should be. And I also believe that there's a lesson here for the rest of the territories and also the rest of the United States um, there's a unique opportunity here that as we build a true digital infrastructure for health in the territories, uh, this will be a lesson and a, a good example of how we can even improve our uh, health services. I'm from Virginia, in Virginia, right, and, and particularly rural Virginia. Um, so I, I, I wanted to address a couple of themes that some of the speakers spoke to because I, I, I think they're interesting. There's one, there's build it as it should be. The other is there's been a lot of talk about the importance of a health digital infrastructure, and underlying that is data, an interoperable structure, and, and I just want to accent that. I won't continue to talk about that, but I'm just building upon that. Um, the other is the importance of the public-private partnership. You'll hear that a lot. Um, this is extremely important. Uh, a good example of this is when I was at the HIMSS conference uh, with NHIT, uh, there was a person speaking from the U.S. Virgin Islands uh, from one of their health facilities, right? Not a big hospital, but a facility out in the community. And they talked about sort of the real world delivery of all of this. And this is what I find, these are the things I find fascinating, right? Uh, I, I think it's simple or oversimplified. You can imagine you hear there's a place distance far away and there's a terrible storm. And you think, oh boy, I hope they can get to the hospital. But the reality is most of the people are getting their services from these health community centers. And this one center talked about, you know, sure, there was day one, you know, and, and then it dragged on to days 45 and, and on. Um, but their parking lot would fill with people uh, who couldn't get internet and couldn't get power, and they would hook into the plugs of the health facility just to charge their phones. They would use the internet there to connect with family and say, hey, I'm okay, and little things like this. And, and this is, this is you know, it's not, there's not a vertical here of healthcare that fits so cleanly that you can define. It's, it's, it's social services, it's human services, it's the community, it's connectivity, it's, it's mental health. It's all of these things that this, these community centers become the lifeline of how these groups survive. And many of those organizations, while they receive federal funds, many are private organizations too, right? So there's this public-private web of how the community leaned on each other to get through these times, and uh, we need to build on that. And, and part of that is NHIT, right? So we've also, there was a theme about um, convening. I appreciate sort of you guys hitting on that because that's where sort of NHIT grows out of as we get into the delivery side of things. Um, we have to convene the people who have the governance and the authority and the funding from government with the people, um, the 115 plus um, uh, health facilities and providers in the area, all to serve one group of people, essentially patients, right? And um, so this public-private partnership that um, NHIT is putting together in both territories and helping the territories co coordinate with each other on some of these shared resources will be, I promise you, it will be a model for all of the United States, including all the territories and the, and the, and the states, 
to learn from. Um, some of the, the way we're doing that, or the key way we're doing that, is uh, we are building a digital services portfolio management team. Now this might seem boring or simple or something like that, but it's, it's a key important, important missing piece. Um, because often, and I found this is true in, you know, in my public service, whether it's at the federal level or working in the territories, what I've noticed with public services is there's a disconnect between governance and policy, which are usually made with good intentions, and there's usually a value proposition in there that someone passed a law or made a rule they want to do something well, and the actual delivery that occurs. And there's all sorts of like how that sausage is made, very wonky, boring things. And sometimes it comes down to um, there isn't the management skills on some level to actually manage the projects, and those things are just given to vendors. Money is just given to vendors for them to deliver something. Sometimes it's acquisition issues, rules and things that sort of go astray within government and public that, that get in the way of actual clean delivery. And so what is a good clean delivery? Well, good clean delivery is what we're putting together with this portfolio management team is an integration of the governance and the policy people but they have to roll up their sleeves. This isn't a board where you sit around and say, hey, that sounds great, and here's the vision where we go. This is a working board where you hear the delivery teams at the grassroots level talking about, these are our blockers. This is what needs to get out of the way. And then all the members, that integrated delivery and governance board, which will be operated by the NHIT team, will help to alleviate well, this one's a, well, that's a policy problem. Let's get that policy changed or removed. Oh, this one's a governance one, or maybe there needs to be a new law passed, or we need to make people aware. We have people at all levels ready to do the work. Um, and that's sort of the inspiring side of this, is um, as we're working with our federal partners and we're working with the local partners in the territory, um, overwhelmingly, everybody wants to get this right. right? Everybody is saying, enough, let's get this fixed, let's improve it, let's build it again, borrow from Congressman Stacey Plessing, let's build it as it should be and get this right. And so that's our commitment to territories. We will be insisting on that and pushing for that constantly. Um, so what does that mean? Like, as you get to the grassroots level, well, um, you've heard the talk about the, the Lifeline Program, the Empower Program, and Pulse Program. I'm going to dig in a little bit on each so you have a general, for those who don't know, a general understanding of what they do. Lifeline gives highly discounted phone service to uh, low-income people and people in underserved communities, okay? Um, this is incredibly important because if you aren't connected to the digital world, you can't partake in the digital world. And the most affordable and most high-impact services that we're going to be able to deliver in the health community is going to be data-based, right? And that data and information is going to come from a digital platform, and these people have to be hooked in. Um, so it's a key federal program from the FCC that's um, one that's important, not only for the territories, but rural areas in, in the states and other, and other territories. There's also HHS uh, Empower, and this is a program that, um, it, it's a great federal program. It's, it, in fact, it's like sort of an like incredible common sense program where if there's gonna be emergencies, there's gonna be things that we can't plan on, and when those happen, there probably won't be power. Well. What if you have a health issue that you are hooked up at home and you're fine at home as long as you have the power? And there's many that we can imagine, and you can imagine in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands going months without power or inter you know, power going in and out. Um, what if you require a machine to you know, do your dialysis? What if you require a machine constantly on to take care of you and do these things? So this program actually tracks those patients who have those issues, so in emergencies, first responders know where do we gotta go first, right? And this is just common sense data collection and information, and um, remarkably in this day and age, particularly in the health industry, we don't have access to or collect this data nearly effective enough, and in Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands, it's, it's even worse so, so you know, we have to focus our energies on that. The other is Pulse. Um, this is a, a, a program that ONC, I think, was behind the funding, is that correct? Um, and Pulse was, is... Uh, What's ONC? Um, People may not know what ONC is. Okay, so... Uh, the you, Office of the National the Coordinator. Office of the National Coordinator. They, they essentially um, oversee health IT um, for, for the federal government standpoint. And um, what Pulse does, and, and, and I think they rolled this out in California first, but um, what Pulse does is 
in a national emergency, if the community like California, who has health and, um, in information exchanges, they're called HIEs for short, right? If you have those, Pulse can hook into those, and the emergency responders can get access to people's health records during an emergency. Now, this is incredibly important because in an emergency, your hospital might be flooded or your community center might be flooded, right? You might be going to a high school to get those services. Well, how do you bring the health records to those services? Um, certainly, if you have filing cabinets of paper, which is the case throughout the territories, you're not moving those during the emergency, right? One easy way is a digital service that can be replicated and moved and, and you can get access to it and essentially move the filing services so that people can be treated uh, with knowledge. But each of these programs or federal programs, they are, if you combine them into a health network, a, a digi health digital services network, they are a pin drop in the hundreds of services and the thousands yet to be invented that I can't even think of, they're so creative, right? And all of these need that information digital highway, I think that Sarah was referring to and, and uh, that you can hook into. And it begins for the territories uh, simply with creating these health information exchanges, right? That's where we're getting started. That's where our focus is. From there, you create a service layer that's a lightweight service layer that's digital, that services and new mobile apps that are being invented and built can hook into seamlessly and eventually self onboard to. So here you can create a smarter and healthier targeted health services. Um, one thing that I want to add to this is, um, and, and one of the things that I'm excited about, because I, I know it's possible, and, I, and I've worked in government and public sector and have done successful delivery like this, um, and the theme I'd like to add is that the services we build should be world class. We have to raise our expectations for what US citizens deserve, and this is true not just in the territories, but every state and rural area. So we should be delivering world class services. We have that capability. The tools exist. We just need to align that with the proper methodologies. So, you know, I just want to throw a few things out that what is world class health service? Um, one, if I'm uh, evacuated from my home ever, I would love my health record to go wherever I go. Uh, in the case of Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico, people went to Florida and then a new storm was about to hit Florida, and so they went somewhere else. And the majority of a lot of those people got lost. We, we didn't know where they went. Um, I would like, if I'm semi-conscious being shipped around the country, I would like my health record to go with me. I'd like to know people if I have, you know, if I have allergies or something like that. And I think everyone should have that world-class service. Um, when I go somewhere and I end up there, um, I also want what treatment I receive to become part of my health record and return home for me because I don't know what service I got. I don't know what happened to me when I was semi-conscious. This should be a minimum expectation of health services in the country, and it's not happening. Um, one, um, if an ambulance shows up at my house, my, my daughter has an EpiPen. And so we've had some scary incidences with it, and it's not fun to go through it when you're worried about your daughter breathing. And thank goodness for, uh, if you want, it's not an ambulance that shows up first at our house. We're about a block away from a firehouse, so it's a fire truck that shows up. I would like those fire trucks. The, the people in that fire truck to have my daughter's health records. I would like them to know coming in the door what allergies she has and things like that. To me, that seems like a low bar world, like world class health service that should be available. All of these things are based in data, and then we are, would like to take these data, anonymous data, but understand in a community, and I'd like to see it mapped out where are our medical needs? Is there a certain community that has issues? Uh, like the HHS and Power Program, where we know we have to give extra power services to, and there are things we can do to prepare for that. These are just helpful, common sense information things. And the other one may seem like it doesn't relate to health IT, but a healthy community is a working community with a strong economy. And as we have an enormous amount of money that's going to be coming out of the federal government, um, and it's going to be flowing into Puerto Rico and um, U.S. Virgin Islands, and, and as well as Texas, and as well as Florida, and some other areas, uh, what I would like to see out of that money um, is not to enrich the classic Beltway bandits, right? Um, but to actually see workforce being developed in those communities. Because if you want to improve healthcare long term in those communities, 
you do it with employment and you do it with people working and, and you build a modern employment center. So we're committed to that. That's one of the pillars of H NHIT. And um, that is all part of a complex, and there's so much more to it, but it's just a world-class health service. So I'm going to stop there and thank everybody for the time. And I don't know if we have another visitor or Donna, do you want to take it? No, I don't have another visitor. Okay. No, but we can open up to questions. We were going to finish a bit early. Um, and I was supposed to do lunch in between um, <laughs> Congress with a basket and a panel, but I didn't. Um, so Are you starving? <laughs> I mean, it's only a little after 12, so I think we can go. And, and let me just say this as well. Um, somewhat at the last minute, some of our federal partners pulled out. Um, even though some of them have had some meetings and gone over their presentations with them and so forth, at the, at the last minute, they were told they could not show up. So this is our only panel, so we're opening up, opening up for questions. Um, Sarah, there are about 90, and I'll ask this to Sarah and to Luis, there are about 90 community health centers in Puerto Rico. How, I mean, in Puerto, the Virgin Islands is small, even though we have three islands. How, how did healthcare, were you able to serve the whole island and all of those health centers? So it's always hard to measure our impact, but um, we were able to serve many of the clinics kind of through other coordinating bodies. So we worked with Luis and his team and the Primary Care Association on the island um, to target which communities kind of needed radios, you know, which ones were priority to receive radio access. And once those had radios, they were able to kind of coordinate and aggregate supply requests. And so there was kind of a lot of you know, rolling up and aggregating of needs um, rather than trying to service every single island, um, clinic rather. But um, no, it, I mean, it, it was very difficult, especially with communications being down. Um, so kind of working, there can never be kind of too much coordination and working with partners on, on those aspects. <laughs> yeah. well, one of the things that we um, did early on, we realized that uh, FEMA had uh, in their database of uh, the hospitals from a procurement perspective to issue orders. Uh, but what was not in any of those maps uh, were the federally qualified health centers in their uh, satellite offices. So we did, if you go to nhitcare.org, which is the campaign that we launched, we put together an open source map that highlights of all the federally qualified health centers and the satellite offices. And you can actually narrow down to the community. Uh, one of the advantages that we had uh, on the ground is we, we have um, been in Puerto Rico for a while, right? Personally, uh, I launched the Hems Latino community in 2010, uh, so I helped uh, launch the chapter uh, in Puerto Rico. Um, NHIT has been in Puerto Rico, and we had um, partners, um, because we work with the Puerto Rico Regional Extension Center, um, we had partners uh, on the ground. So we teamed up with the Primary Care Association, uh, and through text, uh, was able to get real live uh, information, uh, and sometimes uh, being, uh, we were able to uh, provide that information to our federal partners um, in, in real time. Uh, and that's how we teamed up with Healthcare Ready uh, and came together uh, with the Sprint team that was on the ground uh, to get those two-way radios to these centers. Uh, we wanted to get satellites on phones in, into the ground when we realized, it, uh, and what they was telling us, the satellite phones are not working. Uh, two-way radios uh, are a lot better for us in, in terms of coordinating uh, the providers that are going out into um, the communities. Uh, so we got um, those two radio radios um, together. And then what we realized uh, through another partner that we had um, throughout the years in SPEDA, it was that uh, the mental health uh, issues in Puerto Rico were increasing um, significantly. So we um, helped working with Healthcare Ready and Sprint uh, and FEMA, uh, we helped prioritize getting um, and speed up back up and running their uh, 12 clinics and their one hospital in Ponce. So uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Questions? Yes, hi, Thank you. 
Pokemon, for example, or um, in the same instance, how are you able to, for example, track your um, health records when it's largely taboo to enter health clinics for the sake of, you know, for the potential that you could be reported to ICE, for example? Mm -hmm. How would you be able to reject that? Mm -hmm. Or not? Um, it's difficult, right, because what you have here is um, uh, a community that's scared to participate, for lack of a better term, right? So, um, and yet we need the participation for us to understand the, the whole of our you know, responsibility for health care in this country. We, in fact, this is true not just with undocumented, but even just underserved communities. There's lack of participation in the systems, and the um, Luis can go into some stories about they don't get counted. <laughs> you know, it just, you know, we don't know. So the key here, the way you go about doing it, I, I unfortunately don't have the slick answer because that I, I'm not that community, right? Um, but the people I know or, or read about in that community, they will seek very local health services, right? So if you think we were talking about health facilities, there's even smaller health facilities out there that uh, may even be a bit off the radar. And, and I think the angle there is around patient-centered health services. And, and what I mean by that is there's a term in the digital services world of user-centered or human-centered services. And what we need to do is flip the value proposition to not be so focused on stakeholders and hospitals and all of these big things that we do with healthcare and the technologies even, right? It's actually to focus on what's the journey of the individual patients and what is it like for them and what is their value proposition, and, and so what I would say is they are likely receiving health care from somewhere, right, and, and the key is to engage that community in a patient-centered way and figure out how you can engage them with tools that they need that help, that, that help their health services, right? There's not one app you can build that's going to work for everybody and everyone's going to like, but fortunately we have the ability we can build multiple ones and, and do more engagement. And I think that Chen um, being from Texas probably can give us some. Yeah. So I, I want to ask all of you to, for a moment, let yourself imagine outside the box. Right? It's more, I would go even a step beyond what Greg was talking about. It's about thinking no longer providers in the hospital. Think about, or clinic for that matter, or even small health services. Think about patient in the community. And really, think about what we what's changed in our retail life. Okay, you used to have to go to the store. You think about what the store has. Today, you don't have to. You just have to get on Amazon, <laughs> maybe other website. But the point is, and I always use this. I don't know how many people remember the landing tree mortgage commercial on TV. It really struck me. Yeah, you know, the mm -hmm. whole thing about when the when the bankers come to you. Uh, you know about digital e insurance. I mean, e-mortgage, mm -hmm. um, when the banks come to you to compete for you, that's what we need to do. Now, if you have that infrastructure, which is really what we try to build in South Texas, that ecosystem, which is not anchored on any enterprises, even the federally qualified center is not the center of it, because it cannot be, because they can only do so much. It's not the retailer. It should not, how can should not be in our CVS or Walmart? They should be part of it. So how do you build that? really truly patient and community and consumer focused ecosystem is served to facilitate so that now the choice is, do you go to FQAC? Do you have a telemedicine virtual care, which is going to be a big part in any of these disaster areas that we have to be able to deliver? And, and how do you make sure that the consumer, in this case, who is in need of service in the healthcare uh, area, can choose because they may have different need and they have different uh, ability to pay and like it or not, we need to give them the basic that they need, even though it may not be the best that one can get because we can't, not everybody can get the best. That's the reality of the world. So it's how do you build that ecosystem so that you turn the whole thing around? It's all going to be about the patients. So I would say, you know, in this territory, yeah, the FQAC need to be connected and they definitely are. And when it comes to, oh, what? Actually, the question is about trust. So the experience there is that if you have the infrastructure in the background, which is the enablement, then your community health worker becomes a front line. They are the one that, whether they are un uninsured or they're undocumented, they are the one they trust. They, they don't even trust the doctors. 
or the nurses. They trust the community health worker. They can, they can align them, but the community health worker needs to have the capability to help guide them to these capability that's cloud-based, that come from, you know, that's not limited to what's available locally. So I think the ecosystem that reach these populations need to be the hybrid. You have that agnostic sort of, in, in some way, very technology-driven capability that deliver 80% of it. And that last 20% need to be in the community and is optimized or treat for the populations there so that you have the right people. So what we have to build is not just the capability is the service layer, but actually is a human layer that you have to build that connect to the service, connect to the technology, because without all three layers in place, you're not gonna touch these people. So that's really, to me, I think there's models out there from other industries that clearly have worked. We've been experimenting to try to think about how to evolve that to add what healthcare needs, because healthcare is very different from commerce. Um, but there are a lot of shared lessons that we can learn and a lot of capability. But I do come back to the point where I mentioned you need a service layer that bridges the gap between the intent and the delivery service. Um, but that needs to be based on actual local human needs at the end of the day. It can't be remote. And you know, like it, uh, as you say that, the last time I was on a panel with uh, Nicolette, we were talking about some of this. And there's always been a cert, um, a citizens emergency response team or something like that. Mm -hmm. Y'all have those in your community? There needs to be one, that's for, or at least they need to be trained in health as well, so that those people would be your community health worker type, type folks that would be already in the community, have some um, knowledge about this, who, who's there and what the healthcare needs of the, the community that they're in. I, you know, it's, it's just something that I think really needs to happen that we need to beef up those CERT teams and, CERT teams and um, also have them trained in at uh, least basic disaster response. I think it's, it's train and also real-time support, you know, because they can be trained on everything, but if you have connection and they actually have back in has technology to support them, you can give them the instruction, you can give them just in time, you know, knowledge so that they can react um, and then the other thing I do want to add in terms of the trust issue, which I hinted at you know, in my presentation, there is value to have a mutual party. That's not the government, that's not the state, as the provider. So one of the things that actually helps a little bit, you know, doesn't solve all the problems, in terms of sharing the information is, the information, for example, in our project, doesn't go to any state, federal law any entity. It is a neutral for-profit, if you want to think about it, a private industry that sort of is a service they provide. And there are pros and cons to that, but actually it does, you know, it, especially among the undocumented, it has a certain uh, advantage to be able to present that to them. One, one thing I want to add, which is the point she was bringing up, um, the, the term is now used industry 4.0, just from a technology standpoint, that the world is, we're now in like a fourth industry. And we designed our healthcare services a long time ago as factory models. You go to a hospital and you go through the factory, right? And even the healthcare centers that you're referring to are factories and things like that. We're actually returning because the technologies have come down in place so much and, and an individual with one of some pieces of equipment can perform all sorts of tests and do all sorts of things. The prices have come down, we've returned to cottage industry. And what you're referring to is today as we speak, there's a return to people visiting homes and and being in the local community and checking in with people with amazing technologies around them that allow them to do things they couldn't have done years before. Hopefully not cottage industries. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll go to the lady at the back and then I'll come to the back. Well, I just want to say that we have the Medical Reserve Corps, which is the medical equivalent for volunteers. They're throughout the country, hundreds of them, uh, usually linked to local and state health departments. And Pulse, I know, has a system for linking in volunteers, um, including Medical Reserve Corps, and getting them access to medical records. 
So I just wanted to let people know that the Medical Reserve Board is out there. Um, also, many people will go to free clinics, and more and more free clinics have electronic records um, linked to systems. And so linking in free clinics 